We're going to Japan today. We're going to be exploring the legendary Mount Fuji. I've been sent some stories about this in the past, and I've never gotten enough to do a whole video. But today, I'm finally getting around to doing so. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. Today, we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true Mount Fuji horror stories. As usual, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net. I'm always looking for new scary tales to share with everyone here in the swamp. Be sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you're new, and get ready for these allegedly true and creepy Mount Fuji horror stories that'll keep you up tonight. So I want to start by saying that I'm not very good with English, so please forgive me if there's a grammatical error or typo, and this is also my first time sharing something here on the show, but I would like to share my creepy experiences from Japan in the future. Last December, we decided to take a three-week vacation in Japan. We stayed at our friend's house in Ichihara, Shiba, during our stay there. My mom and dad experienced some bizarre and unexplained stuff, as well as myself. My experience. It was our third day. We went to Mount Fuji, which is far from where we were staying. It was around 10 p.m. My mom was fixing luggage. She always wants our things to be organized and such, and my dad was scrolling through his phone. I, on the other hand, was on the couch watching some random YouTube videos. Keep in mind that my mom and dad were together and chatting, and I was relaxing on the couch doing my thing when my dad suddenly looked at me with disbelief in his eyes and said, why do you keep touching and turning on my camera? Which is a GoPro. He doesn't like me touching it because I'm irresponsible apparently. But anyway, I told my dad, what do you mean? I, I never touched or even went close to that thing. He shrugged and went back to his phone. The camera was beside him. It was placed on a box far from where I was sitting. Fast forward, when I asked about the incident, he told me that the GoPro kept turning on and kept on turning off. Also, the camera would keep on switching sides, which is weird. So, a week after, our friend, whose house we were staying at, which is right near the base of Mount Fuji, had to go out of town, but he said that we could stay at his home for as long as we liked. We are excellent friends with him, so there's no real problem with that. He asked if I would like to play some video games, so I said sure. He let me borrow his PlayStation 4, and at night, before going to bed, I would hop in for a couple of minutes and sleep afterward. I will try my best to describe the place. So the house is tiny, probably suitable for one or two people. When you enter the house, there's a little space where you must put on your shoes or slippers before you enter the house. After that is the kitchen at the right. On the left side is the dining table. In the north area is the living room. A sliding door divides the kitchen and the living room. The right side of the living room is in the bedroom and bathroom. I'm sorry if my description is not very good. It was 1am and my parents were asleep in the living room, and at the time, I was playing Call of Duty World War II in the bedroom. The PlayStation 4 and the monitor were set up near the door to see the kitchen area. I decided to close half of the door because it was freezing at the time. While playing in my peripheral vision, I kept seeing a shadow figure who kept on walking from the kitchen to the bedroom door. And there was also a time where I could see the shadow figure from the bathroom, which is just beside the bedroom. I felt terrified, so I decided to turn off the console and go to the living room to try to sleep. Another experience I had when we woke up early was because we had to go to Fuji Q Amusement Park, and the car we rented would be at the house at 10am, so I was the last person to take a shower. While doing so, my mom told me that they had to go to 7-Eleven real quick to buy some drinks and chips because it would be a long trip. The store is about a 10 minute walk from the house. I was doing my business when I heard someone laughing from the living room. It sounded like a girl and I didn't overthink it. I thought it was just my imagination or whatnot. Maybe even the neighbors, who knows. After a few seconds, I heard some footsteps coming towards where I was. I didn't know what to feel at the time, but all I could say is that it was this bizarre feeling it just didn't feel right. I don't know about you guys, but I know the footsteps of my mom and dad, and the footsteps I heard were not familiar at all. 
Again, I didn't overthink it. I said to myself that it was probably just my mom. I turned off the switch and got out of the shower, and to my surprise, nobody was in the house. Probably a minute or two later, I heard my mom and dad talking outside the home, opened it, and asked if I was finished. I told them what happened, but they just smiled and continued with what they had to do. This next one is my mom's experience. So, around two weeks, we decided to take a day off from going out and stay home. We washed our clothes and cleaned the house. It was around 8pm and my mom was in the bathroom brushing her teeth. I was in the bedroom playing PS4 when suddenly she came to me and said, Did you say anything? Or were you watching something? I said no. Mom, why? What happened? She ignored my question and decided to ask my dad. How about you? Did you say something? My dad said nothing. We asked her why and she said, I heard a man with an intense voice talking and murmuring things. My mom said, She said the man speaks Nahongo but she couldn't quite understand what the man was saying. It's not something my mom likes to talk about, but I do think she sees ghosts and feels them. I'll post some of her stories in the future. My dad also had an experience too. For two weeks, we slept in the living room because it has more space and is more comfortable. I guess you can say compared to the bedroom. My dad kept saying that he kept waking up at 3 a.m. and wouldn't be able to sleep afterward because he felt like someone or something was watching him and it was eerie. Every day, 3 a.m. on the dot, my dad would hear noises coming from the other room, like the chair being dragged across the room, like someone was playing with it. The floor that this house was made of was wood, so you could hear the noise bounce off. He also claimed that he listened to the keyboard clicking, and it was coming from the bedroom, but my dad, being skeptical about Ghost, brushed it off and said he thought maybe the noise was just my neighbor from above. He told the story to the owner of the house, and our jaw dropped when he said, Nobody's living above. It was just you guys here the entire time. After that incident, my dad became a pretty strong believer in the paranormal. We've heard a lot of paranormal stories from our friends there who are living in Japan, especially in the Mount Fuji area. Mount Fuji is one of the highest volcanoes in all of Asia and happens to be one of the most sacred sites in all of Japan. The mountain is a cultural icon and on a clear day, those busying themselves with work or home life in the capital Tokyo are able to see the mountain's exceptionally symmetrical snow-capped peaks in the far distance. Mount Fuji is a regular fixture in art and photographs, being one of the most common scenes depicted on Japanese postcards thousands of which are sent all around the world from Japan each year. But on the northwestern side of Mount Fuji, set onto 30 square kilometers of hardened lava, lies a forest known as Akigahara. The Akigahara Forest, sometimes known as the Sea of Trees, can be extremely dense in places, with the porous lava rock red of the forest having properties which make it adept as absorbing sound waves. This can give visitors a sense of absolute solitude, making it a popular destination for the less savory activities such as hiking or camping. You see, the Akigahara has a historical reputation in Japan for being home for the Yurai, a name given to the ghost of the dead in Japanese mythology. This is down to a number of reasons, but the most prevalent is the fact that the Akigahara is known quite bluntly as the Suicide Forest. Every year, scores of Japanese men and women venture into the forest to end their lives. These incidents have become so frequent over the past 50 years or so that Japanese authorities have placed signs at the head of some of the trails, urging visitors to think of their families and to contact suicide prevention hotlines. In 2003 alone, over 100 bodies were located in the Akigahara, an increase from the previous year's 78. During the year 2010, Japanese police noted that more than 200 people had attempted suicide in the forest, with just over 50 of them having completed the morbid act. Undeterred by the many signs and warnings given to those who venture out there, perhaps the most common method of suicide in the deep woods near Mount Fuji are drug overdoses or hanging. Although many more creative methods have been observed by the annual body searches conducted by police, volunteers, and journalists. It is also morbidly interesting to note 
that the suicide rate in Japan increases during the month of March, being the end of the fiscal year for Japanese businesses and traders. So much so, that in recent years, local officials have made a huge effort to stop publicizing the forced suicide figures in an attempt to curb the Akigahara's popularity as a destination for suicides. The site's popularity has often been attributed to Saiko Matsumoto's 1961 novel Nami no To, known in English as The Tower of Waves. The novel is the story of a Japanese couple who, on discovering that fate has rendered it impossible for them to be together happily, take a trip into the deep woods near Mount Fuji, wherein they complete a suicide pact. It is still considered one of the most romantic novels ever published on the Japanese market, but the blame for the suicides in the Akigahara cannot be placed squarely on the feet of Mr. Matsumoto. For there is another book, written by the author Waturu Surumi, that details the hardness of living in Japanese society. It is known as the Complete Manual of Suicide, First published on July 4, 1993, the book went on to sell more than 1 million copies in the Japanese domestic literature market alone. In the postscript, Tsurumi says to think that at the worst crucial moment, one can escape from the pain by committing suicide, one can live in that moment easier. So by distributing this book, I want to make this stifling society an easier place to live in. This is the aim of this book and I never intend to encourage readers to commit suicide. Although the book is quite clearly an instructional manual, the author explains his philosophy throughout and opposes the social pressure to live strong. He details every single method, rating different aspects of each technique such as painfulness, gruesomeness of the body, probability of failure, and cost and event of failure. The fact that one can easily identify the least painful and easiest method of... Suicide is um, extremely controversial at the time, that's for sure. However, the history of suicide in the Akigahara predates both novels' publication, and the place has long been associated with death. For example, there is a practice in Japan that is literally translated to abandoning an old woman, whereby an infirm or elderly relative was carried to a mountain or some other remote desolate place and left there to die. Despite being an ancient and archaic practice, senicide was practiced in Japan well into the 19th century, long after other cultures had abandoned it in favor of the elongation of life, palliative care, or general comfort and respect for the elderly. It is this that primarily led to the Akigahara to be thought of as haunted by the yurai of those who were left there to die. However, despite local authorities' efforts to curtail interest in the suicide forest, Fairly recent events have brought public attention back towards it in a huge way. You can thank some of that to YouTuber Logan Paul, the Ohio native who faced one huge online backlash over a YouTube video he posted during a visit to Japan, one which showed the body of an apparent suicide victim. The video diary style post entailed Logan with his friends heading into the suicide forest to film a so-called haunted area. There, they came across a man's body. It is clear that they were incredibly shocked by what they saw before them, with a couple of screenshots of Logan's expression being the mainstay of video thumbnail. But outrage was widespread when Paul and his accompaniment began to apparently make jokes, making light of an incredibly dark situation and inviting a torrent of criticism upon them. The identity of the deceased man is not known, and Paul's team had taken the time to blur out the identity of the man and the facial features. Online comments have called the Japan video, which garnered millions of views of YouTube, disrespectful and disgusting. Paul's channels were removed from the YouTube Google Preferred program, which brand so adds on. On average, every year in Japan, more than 25,000 people take their own lives. That's 70 every single day, the vast majority being men. The grim self-immolation of a 71-year-old man aboard a Japanese bullet train in 2014 once again rammed the issue back into the headlines. As he tipped the liquid over himself, he is reported to have shooed away the passengers, telling them it was dangerous. What drove a quiet, elderly man to douse himself with fuel and set fire to it in a panicked carriage on a speeding train will never really be explained. Why do people choose life over death? These questions that may well go unanswered for as long as there are human beings to ask them. And as long as there are, the Okigahara Forest will still have those little colored ribbons for those souls not quite lost to find their way back.
It was a Friday evening, and I was truly exhausted. I thought to myself that it had felt like a millennia since I had a break from work. The request I had asked for last week to take a vacation, an effort to relieve myself from the daily grind I had become accustomed to, was granted by a manager. So I began to take my leave. Saying my goodbyes to some favored co-workers, I gathered my belongings and headed home for the weekend. A certainty was made on going to Japan after a week of indecisive anticipation on where to hold my vacation. With the plane and hotel tickets in my console, I was glad to have finally made my decision and what I would do there. I'm going to Japan, to Akigahara, I reminded myself repeatedly. The one place in the world that has always intrigued me beyond ends. The world-renowned forest known as the Sea of Trees to many. The Suicide Forest to those who quickly seek their final destination. The death of those who held their last honor. It held a strong ring in my mind. I quickly packed a large suitcase and two small travel bags after I got home, filled with the essentials for the week ahead of me. Eager to remind myself multiple times, I continuously glanced at the ticket, informing me that the flight leaves tonight. The ride to the airport quickly passed and I found my gate within the first couple of glances, close to the entrance. After checking in my bags, relieving myself of the largest... I made my way to the gate and onto the plane. It was a small one-aisle commercial plane, which made finding my designated seat effortless. I didn't converse much with the other passengers, but I did request a couple of glasses of whiskey and a meal from the selection given by an attendant. The flight went on for what seemed like hours as the passengers and myself was alerted by the captain that we have arrived at Japan and that touchdown will be made in just a few minutes. Once the plane had landed, I began towards the exit gate, collecting my rental vehicle keys and suitcase from a clerk, and out the doors of the airport. My requested rental vehicle was parked in the designated lot midway down to the end of the lot. Packing my luggage into the trunk and unlocking the door, I took a couple of minutes to gather my thoughts as I sat in the driver's seat. Overwhelmed by the possibilities, I reflected heavily on what to expect in my journey here and how extravagant everything seemed to be in the rural community. I took a sigh of relief over the smoothness of the travel so far and started my car to life. It took some time to find my hotel, passing through the city and marveling at the architecture along the way, as I had realized I had passed it multiple times. The sun had just begun to rise and I was beginning to feel more wary. Parking in a nearly empty lot and gathering my bags, I walked into the hotel and checked in, receiving my room number and the door key. Upon entering the room, I walked in and noticed that my surroundings had been simple. There was a little blue room with a queen-sized bed snug up against the wall, two nightstands on either side, a small recliner on the left corner, close to the window, a small entertainment unit with a residing, moderate-sized television, and another door in the back, of which I assumed to be the bathroom. I placed my belongings on the side of the door and crashed on the bed, falling into slumber quickly. When I arose, the light shined through my window and indicated that the sun was midway from setting. This is a great way to mess up my internal clock, I said to myself with a sarcastic tone. My stomach gurgling at me in discernment, I reminded myself that there was a small noodle stand within walking distance from the hotel, of which I saw previously on the ride to the hotel. Removing myself from the bed, getting dressed, and walking out the door, locking it behind me, I made my way towards the noodle stand riding in my car. When I arrived to it, there were only a few sitting at its bar, with two empty seats. I made my order with slight difficulty and waited patiently as I sipped on the herbal tea the meal came with. The wait wasn't too long, as the chef placed a steaming bowl of noodles complemented by a portion of fish and vegetables in front of me. The food smelled amazing and the taste was unlike any I've ever had. I ate faster than I should have and finished just as the sun sat on the horizon. Japan, from my view was marvelous and had so much glory and beauty. I hopped back in my car and began to travel to the visitor center of Akigahara. Upon my approach to the center, I noticed it was closed for the night, but I refused to let that yield my expectations. I parked off to the side, taking my travel flashlight from the console, locking my car and looked out to the forest ahead. It felt surreal the sea of trees swaying in the gentle breeze as a murmur of nightlife inside echoed through it. 
As I walked towards it, I could swear I felt somber eyes lay on me. Their melancholy gaze was moderately unsettling, but beckoned my soul to traverse the landscape with them, among them. I hiked into the woods, the breeze nipping at my face as the forest towered over me, larger than life itself, branches intermingled and roots twisted slightly above the ground, descending into the soft earth below. I pressed on, avoiding the natural obstructions while shining my flashlight ahead. Whispers grew as I ventured deeper in. Wails began forming in the distance as if the life of the land preserved those who shed their last bits of honor into the nature around them. I progressed for a seamless amount of time, as I was lured around winding trails thinning into the environment. Tree limbs snapped and leaves brushed around me as if the auras of the once long past never could leave this eerie region. Chills formed down the course of my spine as I saw a large tree a ways off. As I reached the tree, it was a thick column of bark, but it didn't look right. It seemed as if the tree had died long ago with no leaves adorning its branches and its patched bark parting itself. Then I noticed it. There was a fragment of bone at the base of the tree. More bones were nestled in its wake with a skull off to the side. As I observed the disturbing sight, something dropped from above me, tapping the back of my head as it fell to the ground and slumped next to the skeletal remains. It was a scroll. Shining my flashlight away from the skeleton and onto the object, I could tell it looked very old, almost ancient. This startled me as I could not decide whether to take the rolled parchment or not. In a final effort, I reached down and picked it up gently. The thing felt as if it would crumble in my hand, but it attempted to maintain its shape. Done with the forest, I made my way out of this place, hurriedly trudging along through recognizable areas as the wails grew louder behind me. The whispers became melancholic screams and the sound of tiptoeing became trampling through the woods. Horror flew through my mind as if there was a legion of dead soldiers after my very soul, ready to drag me back into the trees and claim my life for themselves. They want me, I began to tell myself. They are screaming for something and I refuse to give it. There are so many of them. Why do they want me? I barely managed to evade the branches that attempted to snag me in the roots below that tried to fleet my feet. I neared the edge of the woods, relieved and terrified that I even found my way back. As soon as I had left the edge, everything stopped. Pure silence. It was one of the most startling stillnesses that I had ever been a part of, and it terrified me. Everything set around me in complete silence. Then I heard a subtle sound that I couldn't determine. It was like a clacking sound. It was calm and calculative. I fled away from that sound. It rung in my ears. I knew I had bitten off more than I had bargained for at that moment, and I swore I knew everything about that damn forest. My car was farther away from me than I had thought, but I managed towards it, exhausted from my overexertion. I settled back into the driver's seat, sitting there for a long while as I tried to regain composure. That night had been far too much for me. I drove quickly back to my hotel room and slumped into the recliner. I glanced at my hand, the scroll still hidden in my grasp. A sense of curiosity filled me as I grasped it with both hands and slowly unrolled it. Unfolding it was one extensively long piece and peered at its scribbles. Damn it, it's all in Japanese. Maybe one of my friends can translate it, I told myself aloud. I held my phone in my trembling hands, trying my best to take clear pictures of it. I sent the picture of the kanji to my friend, who I knew was well versed in this language as long with a text that briefly said how I had apprehended it. I went to my bedroom, and I laid on top of the covers, quickly falling asleep, though, through the night, I was unable to get any real meaningful rest as I heard movement in my room. The clacking of what sounded like wooden sandals kept pacing, startling me in my slumber. I flipped over and sat up and heard mumbling in a foreign language, then the clinking of metal on the walls and on the nightstands every so often. I was paralyzed by intense fear, aware of something watching me with such intent. I just couldn't get any rest. I just sat there, wishing away the burden. The sun had finally risen through my window, slowly, honestly agonizingly slow. 
the bags I acquired under my eyes weighed on my face from my sleepless night. My phone vibrated to life on the nightstand, and I was very wary of even collecting it, but I did so. Slowly, I reached for it and retrieved it from its resting place. The screen sent a bright light into my eyes, blinding me for just a second, until I regained composure. It was a text from my friend along with five others that I had not heard through the night. The first said, Wow, that's amazing. I'll try my best to translate it for you. The second went on to say, I don't feel right about this now. Some of it's hard to translate. It's so long, almost like journal entries of a ronin that had a family. But the third text had become more fearful. This ended up to be a real messed up story. I don't know if I should be reading this. It's not right. The fourth was a bunch of gibberish that I couldn't make out. But the text was what I wanted all along. He finally said, I got it translated. I never want to see this again. In fact, don't you dare speak to me about it ever again. I sent it to your email. I switched apps to my email, loading it. Scrolling through to find what I wanted. The attachment. He was right. It was like a journal, and it began, Evening of October 8th. I have came back from my adventure, just as my clan gave me an order. I fear for my life on what I should do, but I am proven in their eyes to never have feared anything. They know not what they do. Morning of October 9th. They have told me everything I needed to know, and I still fear silently. They plan for me to assassinate one of our area shogun and his family. I understand the guy is known for dishonorable deeds, but I can't shake the feeling. I know this will not end well, but I have pledged loyalty. Morning of October 12th. After two days of brushing up on my technique, I have gained more courage and feel better about my order. I know what I must do now and how I would do it. This is going to be silent and very low. With the light armor on that I'm going to be wearing, wind on my feet, I will travel with fire's edge. My mind is set. Nightfall, October 23rd. After my long journey and frequent stops to await the passing of autumn, I can see the edge of the city and its high walls. Passing merchants grant me luck through the chilling air. Looks like harvest has yielded them bounties well. Traveling camps have come to collect good tidings for the ascending winter. My hidden armor gains no wary sights, and I am glad. I should settle in one of the inns near the wall. Dead of Night, November 7th. Since my last entry, I have found the routes of my target, alleyways that seem reasonable, and the location of his house. He has a wife, two geisha, and two children, a boy and a girl. Sad to say, but his corrupt seed shall never pass on. I have observed his wrongdoings and how he treats the community, and anger is boiling like a hot spring within me. This must be stopped. Nightfall, November 10th. I removed my getta for silent movement and ascended on his path like the silence of shadows. I tailed the target, my chosen location, and gagged with cloth. I dragged him into the valley, bound in rope and pierced the throat with precision. I gouged his eyes out and taken them from his hand. He shall not feel the cool breeze nor shall he see the beauty of his afterlife. Farewell, demon of men. I made easy passage into his home and scoured the rooms with the swiftness of a winter's night. His children were given swift deaths, penetrating their heads with a kabutin before making my way to his wife. She was just as corrupt as her husband, so I gagged her as well, roped her to the wall, and sliced her thoroughly with my comma many times. As my two final acts, I made a deep incision from her womb to her neck and relieved her of her tongue with my katana. The afterlife shall not bear witness to her venomous words. I silently left the house and made my way through the city gate, collecting my getta, a fresh pair of clothes. The guards suspect nothing. The deed is done. Dead of night, December 6th. I've lost my way. The heavy snow rushed in from the north, swallowing my surroundings. I know not where I am, only the entwining of the forest hold my ground. I have caught whispers of small foot soldier groups trying to track my movement. The snow hides my steps for now, but lay burden to my waist. I think they know where I am. This city have hired smart men. 
Midday, December 10th. I can hear them now. They have caught up to me and I can smell them on my heels. The fast winds of my steps have failed me and I'm running out of time. Have I killed the wrong man? Was this influence too great of a power? My fear resides in my dark deaths. Izanami no Kami, preserve me. My time has come. Break of Dawn. I did it. I barely managed to beat the odds. But nothing has saved me yet. There were ten of them. The winds fell through them like fallen leaves as they charged me with might. I have never fought so hard, slicing with fleet foot and anger. The fallen snow held no grounds on me as I, as I left with cuts, but they got me. My side is bleeding badly. I wrapped it with the cloth from my hakama, but it won't stop. Nightfall. I have been careless. There was an assassin official a day behind them. He came to me, wished me a final goodbye. He knew my deeds were just. He allowed my final entry. He should have not. Preserve me in this scroll, please. My spirit may claim more lives as justice. My seppuku ritual, hold me. May luck be with you, for assassin. Assassin final entry. The clever bastard was able to pass on, but not gone. I saw him split his belly open. His innards and blood drenched this parchment. I decapitated him and stamped the back with the cut of his neck. I will be remembered, not by the way he planned. I felt my stomach turn as the final passage read before me. Horror-stricken, I set my gaze on the scroll. It was not stained with the blood of the man. How could this be? Has he returned to finish the curse? Questions filled my mind. As I looked away from the paper, I saw a slight shimmer of light in the corner of the room. The sun danced lovingly off the tip of an ethereal sheath. I pissed myself. My warm liquids drenching through my pants and around me. I knew what was about to happen. The silhouette of a gaunt figure walked slowly towards me. The clacking of wood embraced the floor with each step. Then I saw it. The form of a translucent blade had escaped its confines and into the thin of the air. The silhouette formed into a man. A red shimmer glowed through his geza as he held his sword out and swung with a supernatural accuracy. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true Mount Fuji and I guess you could say Suicide Forest Horror Stories. As always, if you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it in the algorithm and that's incredibly helpful for the swamp. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcast or another platform, please be sure to give this a 5 star rating over there as it helps us grow there and it's incredibly helpful. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode as I upload them nearly every single day and all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, whether it's something from Japan, the United States, or no matter where you live in the world, send it on in at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you're on the go, but don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are in the world, you can download them absolutely free from Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It's absolutely free to do so, and always will be. If you would like to support the Swamp outside of hitting that like button, subscribing, and maybe giving us a 5 star rating on Apple Podcasts, check out the merch store. I've got t-shirts, hoodies, face masks, and more. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool swamp threads. Be sure to join me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy video.